Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Keisha Blaine, and I'm currently a fellow at the Carr Center. I'm also an associate professor of history at the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm delighted uh, to be here this afternoon uh, with Barbara Smith, uh, who I think needs no introduction, but I will still introduce her. Uh, and this is part of the social justice leaders series that I've been um, curating for the Carr Center. The series uh, features uh, an array of dynamic leaders of color who are uh, truly doing remarkable work uh, at the local, national, and international level. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Barbara Smith and also uh, start off with a few questions. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about several different things. And there will be an opportunity for those of you who are watching to ask questions. You'll be able to submit your questions through the chat. Uh, and I'll try to get to as many questions as possible within the hour. Barbara Smith is an author, activist, and independent scholar who has played a groundbreaking role in opening up a national cultural and political dialogue about the intersections of race, class, sexuality, and gender. She was among the first to define an African-American women's literary tradition and to build Black women's studies and Black feminism in the United States. She has been politically active in many movements for social justice since the 1960s. She was co-founder and publisher uh, until 1995 of Kitchen Table, Women of Color Press, the first US publisher for women of color. She now resides in Albany, New York uh, and served two terms as a member of the Albany Common Council from 2006 to 2013. From 2014 uh, to 2017, she served as the Special Community Projects Coordinator for the city of Albany, helping to implement the equity agenda. Barbara Smith has edited three major collections about black women, including All the Women Are White, all the Blacks are men, but some of us are brave. Uh, Black Women's Studies, uh, which came out in 1982, and Home Girls, a Black Feminist Anthology, which came out the following year in 1983. Uh, it goes without saying that I don't think I would even be uh, a scholar uh, were it not for uh, the remarkable legacy and the work of uh, Barbara Smith. And I do remember uh, reading All the Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men, but Some of Us Are Brave reading uh, this remarkable collection uh, and just being transformed by it. And so it's, it's truly an honor. I keep saying that, but I, I mean it so much. And thank you so much, Barbara, for agreeing to have this conversation with me. Thank you so much, Professor Blaine. I'm so happy to be with you and with everyone. Thank you. And so I thought it would be good if we just uh, take a step back for a moment. Could you tell us a bit about your background? What led you on the path to become an activist? Uh, and when did you first begin to identify as a feminist? I think that uh, would be fascinating to talk about, especially with so many debates about the term and, and who might embrace it and who might not. Uh, thank you. I uh, grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. I was born right after World War II. I'm in the first year of the baby boom, which is 1946. And I am a twin. And some people know that my uh, sister is named Beverly Smith, and we were both a part of the Combahee River Collective. My family came from rural Georgia, a town, a little town called Dublin, which is between Macon and Savannah. And I'm loving the news about Georgia these days, I have to say, because um, that's you know, where their roots were. And I, I've always felt that those were my roots too. Uh, my sister and I were the only Northerners in the house. Uh, everybody else was from the South. We were definitely outnumbered and we were also the youngest people in the house. So it went their way. It was their way or the highway. And uh, I often say that I was fortunate uh, to have uh, gotten a Southern upbringing, a Black Southern upbringing in a Northern setting. And uh, education was highly, you know, to say it was highly valued is an understatement. And also uh, my family was involved in the church. So those kinds of cultural references and the kind of grounding you get 
when you grow up in a core black community and are connected to those kinds of institutions. We got uh, that. And um, skipping ahead then, I, I wanna say though, I was involved in the civil rights movement as a teenager in Cleveland. I think we're going to talk about that a bit uh, later because of your work on Fannie Lou Hamer. And to skip ahead then, I did not really see myself in feminism until 1973 when the National Black Feminist Organization, which had just been founded recently, had what they uh, titled their first Eastern Regional Conference. But in reality, women came from all over the country to that conference. And a lot of people who are considered to be luminaries now, like Shirley Chisholm, Eleanor Holmes Norton, June Jordan, Ellis Walker, Faith Ringgold, the artist Faith Ringel, they were all at the conference. So that was really when I thought, okay, so I can be a feminist because it's black feminism. And that's when uh, that path began from that day until this. Wow, and it's, I'm so glad you brought up Fannie Lou Hamer because that's actually the next question I was going to ask you. Um, you know, it. I, I, of course, I know that the two of you met and I know that she had such um, a lasting impression on your life. Uh, could you tell us more about the time that you did meet and also the significance of that encounter? Right. Well, I uh, saw her speak, and I'll never forget that speech that they play now, particularly around these election, you know, presidential elections and the role of Black people in the Democratic Party and et cetera, the history of Black people in the Democratic Party. I saw her give that speech at the 1964 Democratic Convention on television, of course. It wasn't there in Atlantic City. But I remember seeing her speaking. And of course, Black people were not on TV in those days, unless they were in a, a show where they were servants. Um, so just are either tap dancing, uh, Ed Sullivan, the Ed Sullivan show. You'll have to get in your way back machine to figure that one out. But <laughs> the Ed Sullivan show, which was what was called a variety show, he would have black people on and they would sing and they would dance. Um, and that was about it. And to see a black woman just really, she, she was doing a reading, you know, of the United States and of U US supposed democracy. And she asked the question, she's a great speaker, of course. And she asked the question, is this America? And as I said, I saw her and it was, uh, not only was it an extraordinary experience because of the content, but because of the rare, rareness, the rarity, whatever that word is, of having a black person on TV who wasn't singing, dancing, or cleaning. Uh, so, uh, and then um, I think that I was aware of her before uh, 64, because as I said, I was involved in the civil rights movement. I don't know exactly how I would have known about her except from following the civil rights movement and then being involved in it in Cleveland. I met her because I was involved in the civil rights movement. This is as a teenager who just graduated from high school. And our civil rights movement in Cleveland, like many in the North, focused on school desegregation. Mm -hmm. And uh, they made a big effort, the people and the movement made a big effort to get the students who are in the school system involved. And my sister and I were two of those students. And we were quite involved. We would go to uh, demonstrations, rallies, et cetera. We went to uh, event, uh, like uh, actions in front of the Board of Education. And I think about, you know, I think about that past sometime. I think, wow, you were a kid in the public school system and you're going down to the Board of Education and you're picketing. <laughs> How is that going to turn out? <laughs> right. Fortunately, it turned out okay. Right. <laughs> um, my dear aunt who raised my sister and me, let us do those things. And then one night uh, when Fannie Lou Hamer was in Cleveland, I got to meet her after a rally where she had spoken. Yeah, that's remarkable. Uh, and recently you, you published just a, an excellent uh, article in The Nation in which you proposed uh, what you call the Hamer-Baker plan. Uh, could you talk a bit about that? Because of course the plan is named after Fannie Lou Hamer and also Ella Baker. Uh, could you tell us more about uh, why you decided to name the plan after these two black women? Um, and you know, what do their examples mean to you? Right. 
Um, I had written an article earlier in the summer titled The Problem is White Supremacy. It was published in the Boston Globe. And I was just very um, upset. I'll just use the actual word as opposed to trying to you know, be diplomatic. I was very upset, not to say angry, about how people were talking about uh, what was going on in the United States after the lynching of George Floyd, because most people don't want to talk about white supremacy. It's like a no-no. Uh, people will say anything else. They'll talk about racism. They'll talk about discrimination. They'll talk about systemic racism. They'll talk about bigotry. They'll talk about prejudice. They will not talk about white supremacy because if you use the term white supremacy, you are talking about a big, overarching, powerful system that exists to hold power in the hands of a certain group of people. Not all of them are white, but most of them are. And it's, a, it's, it's ideological, white supremacy is ideological. It is also practical and real because it makes sure that there's always an underclass of people of color who can be exploited as far as their labor is concerned, who can be exploited economically. It has a lot of meaning. So that was the article that I wrote, as I said earlier in the summer. And in that article, I said, what would it be like if we had a Marshall Plan or something on the scale of the Marshall Plan to eradicate white supremacy. Because I actually believe that white supremacy could be eradicated if the powers that be decided that they needed and wanted to do that. I don't think they will ever make that decision, at least not in my lifetime. They will not make that decision because it works too good for them. You know, it's just mm -hmm. too good, you know, uh, to be able to put people in certain categories and to have 10 times more wealth, the average white family has 10 times more wealth than the average black family. There's some real benefits to keeping that system going. But when I was asked by the nation then to write an article about what would that plan look like, I thought, well, the first thing I need to do is rename it. And mm -hmm. so I named it the Hamer Baker Plan. And you notice perhaps if you're into, this is like a nerd thing and you'll appreciate it. Um, I always generally uh, put uh, people's names in alphabetical order so that there's mm -hmm. no question about who's more important than who. Um, and that's like for even something on a flyer or something like that, or like a list of speakers or whatever, just use alphabetical order. And then we don't have to wonder about who your right. best friend is in this <laughs> list. And then I also like chronologically, this is the nerd part of like, because um, uh, Ella Baker was older right. than uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, that would have been another reason to put her name first. So both alphabetically and also the fact that she was older and predated Fannie Lou Hamer. But I said, nope, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. Fannie Lou Hamer comes first <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I never uh, met uh, Ella Baker, not that I would need to meet her in order to idolize her because I do idolize her. Um, but th that special connection that I had because I was actually in Fannie Lou Hamer's presence. And also because of the fact that Fannie Lou Hamer was not uh, from the class of black leaders, of, bl of people who are considered to be black leaders, who right. usually get to speak on what the race should be about. So she was the poor black woman who did not, you know, whose, whose uh, education was cut off because of the peonage system in the deep South at the time. She and her family were sharecroppers because she was so smart. She was a timekeeper on a, I believe a cotton plantation. And as I said, she was not from the class yes. that usually got to uh, be recognized as leadership. She also of course was not from the gender mm -hmm. that got to the lead. So as I said, there's just a lot of reasons. And because they were both so visionary and so committed and so courageous and so tenacious. I mean, you know, the adjectives can go on and on about how fantastic these women were in shaping our freedom. Um, I just thought like, if we name it, if I name it after them, then the plan will have that level of integrity mm -hmm. and that level of uh, depth. Yeah, and, and just to talk a, a little bit more about the plan you, discuss uh, what you referred to as an integrated approach. Could you talk about the benefits of that approach, especially as relates to education, healthcare, uh, and criminal justice? 
you know, what could it achieve? What does it look like? Well, I realized uh, that as I was, you know, just, you know, sitting before the blank piece of paper, so to speak, I realized that there were initiatives already in existence that if they were incorporated into something like the Hamer Baker plan, that they would be really significant and useful components of that plan. I'm thinking of the, uh, the Nurse Family Partnership, which I write about, the Harlem Children's Zone, uh, Cure Violence that it addresses very successfully gun violence using a public health model. Uh, I started thinking about these initiatives that I really became familiar with because of having served in office and representing on our uh, common council, which is like, is our city council in Albany, representing a predominantly black and economically challenged community. So as I said, I started thinking about these initiatives, but one of the things about these initiatives is that they do function separately. They don't necessarily get together and say, how does having a nurse family partnership connect to having a very uh, robust initiative to end gun violence in this very same community? How does um, having um, a, an initiative to end gun violence connect to having a pre-K or really birth through, you know, way after college initiative like the Harlem Children's Zone? Uh, to address poverty. Most people think of the Harlem Children's Zone as, an, as a positive educational initiative, which it is. But if you look at what they say their goal is, it is to end poverty, which is really interesting. It's an educational initiative with the goal of ending and addressing poverty. So anyway, I just thought, why not have these, uh, these wonderful initiatives blend together? And then also, if we had an initiative, if we had a plan to end white supremacy, we would explicitly say, that's what we're about doing. Mm -hmm. So instead of it being kind of vague and out there in the ether or whatever, it would be like, no, we are stopping, we're trying to stop gun violence because the reason we have all this gun violence is because of white supremacy. So that's what I had in mind. Well, we have a specific question uh, from someone who's watching. And the question is, do you support ballot measures in states uh, giving citizen committees power to oversee police reforms, uh, do you think this will reduce white supremacy? Ballot initiatives to allow citizens, mm -hmm. would, those, would that be on the local level? Well, of course we can't ask, you know, we can't go back and forth. Most of the, you know, like police forces are, are local entities. They're not state, you know, there are state police, but they have different functions. Some of them are in relationship to criminal activity, but uh, the bulk of policing is uh, administered on a local level. So, however you get to what you know we would you know could be called a civilian police review board or a citizen police review board. However you get to that, of course, I would support that. If it's through a ballot initiative, that's not how it occurred, you know, where I live. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems with these oversight. Uh, these oversight groups is that they often don't have any real power. They, they can't necessarily do investigations uh, when there is police abuse. Um, so it, it can be very frustrating. I was actually, I was drawn to running for the Common Council because of criminal justice police issues. So I know a little bit about that, not because I ever studied it in school, but because I was practically involved. And uh, we have on the Common Council uh, a, um, gosh, I'm going to forget the name of it, a, uh, you know, a, a criminal justice focus uh, committee. And that's, you know, uh, uh, that's a committee that I was on. So um, that's, you know, uh, I, I was, not only was I on it, I was vice chair the first uh, year, mm -hmm. or the first, um, you know, the first term on the council, and then I became chair of that committee. So um, I had a lot of contact with the brass of both the police and the fire department and learned a lot about what the job description is and also dealt with a lot of the problems. Okay. Um, and I wanted to look ahead for a moment, you know, given the historic nature of this past week uh, and of course your uh, ex expertise and experience, uh, 
it would be good to really imagine for a moment what the future looks like, especially in the context of a Biden-Harris administration. What does a Biden-Harris administration mean to you? Well, people might not like this answer. <laughs> um, first of all, I'll just say full disclosure, you know, I was all in for Bernie in 2016 and also in 2019 and, 20, and 2020. Uh, I was a national surrogate for the uh, Senator Sanders campaign in uh, this cycle. And um, that was who I was excited about. I wasn't excited about any of the others uh, who were running for various and different reasons. And they did have, there was a range of political uh, perspectives in that large group of people who were uh, running. Um, I am relieved like millions and millions and millions of people, not only in our country, but around the entire globe, that we have gotten the poison out of the White House. Mm -hmm. uh, we have gotten the evil and ignorance and cruelty. He's, that's on the, uh, the way out. That is a huge, huge relief because they have done so much damage, so much, you know, uh, harm mm -hmm. to the lives of regular human beings, uh, most obviously and notably now with this pandemic that right. is out of control because they saw fit not to do anything about it because they couldn't be bothered. Mm -hmm. And let's make it into a political issue about wearing masks as opposed to trying to save somebody's life. But since you know most people in the nation are not named T-R-U-M-P, that's not their last name, they don't care. you know. So the rest of us, we're out here on our own and we are suffering mightily as a result. So all of that is really, really, really good. But I am not uh, in any way uh, kind of, you know, asleep on the fact that what we have now coming in is another neoliberal uh, administration. The Obama administration was a neoliberal administration and so is this one. And, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats, they play neoliberalism differently, a little bit differently, a little bit of different nuance, you know, but at the end of the day, it's all neoliberal. And neoliberalism is not good for, uh, right. for humans and all life on earth because it doesn't serve the interests of uh, regular people trying to uh, struggle and get by. Yeah, um, and, and in fact, I think, you know, as you were talking, it, it makes me think about just how the conversation has unfolded since the elections. And we've seen several Democrats um, currently in, in a debate over the correct way to approach voters uh, and with some going as far as to blame grassroots movements, uh, specifically, you know, defund the police uh, as reasons why we've seen a loss of democratic congressional seats. Uh, what are your thoughts on this debate? Uh, I can't go there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, if people, you know, haven't guessed by now, I am, as I think I said this at the beginning, I'm a part of the left, you know, have been ever since my college days. That hasn't changed. It's not going to change. So I have a di different perspective on a lot of matters. Um, uh, I'm also a socialist. I am well aware, just to get back to um, to uh, Vice President-elect uh, Kamala Harris uh, being the first woman of color mm -hmm. to, and the first woman uh, to be in that second highest position. I fully understand the historical importance of that. And I'm glad that that, that has occurred. Mm -hmm. That's different from embracing the politics mm -hmm. of what the representative embodies and stands for. So I can be glad that we have gotten to a place that a actual black South Asian woman mm -hmm. could become vice president. And then I can interrogate, okay, so what, what's gonna happen next? What do we stand for? Now to get to this situation of like, it's that people uh, on the left ruined, you know, the chances right. of uh, people uh, on the down ballots, you know, uh, lower uh, down on the on uh, the, the ballot, you know, who are running you know, for different offices like a Congress, Senate, mm -hmm. 
etc. cetera. Uh, I don't agree with that. I have not read all the analysis, but my understanding is that a lot of people who, for example, spoke out for Medicare for all, they won their races. Mm -hmm. And I just mm -hmm. want to say something about defund the police. The people who are calling for defunding the police are either abolition of the police. Mm -hmm. These are serious, committed, primarily black activists. Right. And it is no more radical to me to call for defunding the police than it was to call for in the 20th century, abolishing segregation, mm -hmm. or in the 19th century, abolishing enslavement. Mm -hmm. It's like the same stuff. You know, the 21st century iteration of getting closer on that path to liberation is, okay, we got to deal with the police now. In the 20th century, it was, we got to be able to vote. <laughs> right. And, and not be second-class citizens in every other way. And in the 19th century, of course, is we've got to stop being property. So that's where we are right now. And I don't like, uh, I really don't like uh, using that mm -hmm. as like an excuse for whatever it is that should be happening that isn't happening around uh, dealing with our very, very broken criminal justice system. Thank you for that. Uh, one of the audience members uh, sent out a tweet to ask uh, if you could offer a few thoughts on the lack of critical analysis in the mainstream media when it comes to the role of white women uh, in this past election. I, there are some articles that I've read. I mean, I actually am writing and have been writing another op-ed that will be in the Boston Globe next week. So I've been doing more writing than reading. <laughs> <laughs> during the last uh, few days. But I've seen uh, some articles where indeed that is being interrogated and it does need to be interrogated. I was in a really great political discussion yesterday about why people don't feel like they can organize white women. And the person who was talking about this uh, conundrum described white women as being like the third rail <laughs> that you can't touch. <laughs> and that people will say, no, we can't organize them because it's just like, and it's crazy. It's really crazy because it doesn't really, um, doesn't really kind of connect with the experience that I had building mm -hmm. anti-racist feminism right. in the uh, second wave of the feminist movement from the 1970s on. Um, what, uh, white women were uh, organizing and some of them, the ones that we work with were staunchly anti-racist. And actually a lot of people don't know this, and this is a book that needs to be written, at least one book. Um, probably the most meaningful interventions against uh, racism and challenging racism in the 1970s Reagan and uh, after era were being led and carried out by white feminists, specifically white lesbian feminists. People don't know about that. There's a whole history of anti-racist white feminism that nobody knows about because it's not cute and it's not on the covers of you know fashion magazines and nobody has seen fit so far to do much scholarly or other kinds of work about it. There's a book that will be coming out early next year by a wonderful writer, a journalist named Koa Beck. And it is a book on white feminism. And um, I think it will be helpful in this dialogue, although the focus of the book is primarily on white feminism in the corporate sec sector and in the mainstream media corporate sector. But the lessons and the conclusions that she draws are, uh, I think, accurate for other sectors of, uh, of, of limited lean-in white feminism. Um, I think that, you know, like race and racism, that's the actual third rail in the, in the United States. Uh, not that nobody will touch it, but it's a thing that like, if we use third rail to mean the thing that if you get into it, it's going to be very difficult and very challenging. And that's what underlies, you know, why, why you know, uh, did more white women vote, a, a greater percentage of white women vote for uh, that guy 45 mm -hmm. than previously? 
we have a lot of work to do. And, and, and if, we, if we had a robust national dialogue about racism and white supremacy, maybe not as many white women would have voted for mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. because they would actually understand what they were doing with that vote. Right. And in fact, uh, one of the things that you argued uh, in your op-ed in The Nation is that uh, to understand white supremacy, one has to truly immerse oneself in the literature. And I'm quoting from you. Uh, you said, understand the scope of the problem, read black history, read about the international impact of white supremacy reflected in US imperialism and militarism in non-European countries read classic non-contemporary black authors besides James Baldwin and Toni Morrison, read social science research that provides statistical documentation and analysis of America's rampant inequality. Uh, and so I, I'm hoping you would share with us some other recommendations, you know, what authors, histories uh, and books have had a lasting impact on your views um, and and how, you know, what recommendations would you offer for all of us to better understand white supremacy? Um, thank, that's, I love this question, so thank you. Um, one, of, one of the reasons I wrote it that way and said uh, non-contemporary classic black authors besides Baldwin and Toni Morrison is because everybody's reading them now. Um, and I wanna challenge people, find out about some other Black authors, as opposed to the kind of flavor of the month, Black <laughs> authors, all the accolades and all the attention they're getting mm -hmm. is completely merited, absolutely, without question. I am not talking about their impact or their contributions. What I'm talking about is you need to have a sense of the scope of the issues and the, the, the politics and the culture, all of it that you say that you're interested in and you cannot get it from just reading a couple of people. Having said that, uh, one of my favorite authors of all time, and my field is literature, so I'm gonna give you novels probably more than anything else, but one of, one of my favorite authors of all times is Anne Petrie. Anne Petrie wrote, uh, her, her best known uh, novel is entitled The Street, and it is about a black woman raising her son by herself after her marriage uh, breaks up, uh, struggling economically and trying to find a place to live in Harlem in the 1940s where she and her son can be safe and where perhaps she can leverage her great intelligence, talent and skills into a better life for them. It is a remarkable, remarkable book. And Anne Petrie is not an author that a lot of people know about. She wrote several novels. She wrote children's, uh, some children's books. Uh, and she also, there's also a wonderful collection of short stories. And in fact, uh, the first, the op-ed that I did, I started by talking about, writing about, I should say, not talking about, writing about uh, one of her short stories, which is about the Harlem race riot of 1943. And what I was saying is that, like, why is it that something written about something that happened in 1943 is just as accurate today in 2020. You gotta ask, you gotta, you gotta wonder about that. Uh, Margaret Walker's novel, Jubilee, which is an incredible antidote to Gone with the Wind, which is the most popular novel, probably still is, but certainly a few decades ago, uh, Gone with the Wind was a favorite American novel, which makes you wanna run away. You know, I don't wanna live in a country where Gone with the Wind is a favorite novel. Because right. in this case, then, we're dealing with that antebe antebellum crap, really, just antebellum mm -hmm. crap. So here's an antidote, uh, antidote to it. It's The novel is called Jubilee. Um, I was a sociology major, uh, or at least sociology and English major in college. And I read some of those classic early works about race. There were not that many, and they were often written by white uh, scholars. Uh, one of them is Caste and Class in a Southern Town. I think that's John Dollard. There's a strange career of Jim Crow. And then there's also an American Dilemma by Gunnar Myrdal. These would be really interesting books for people to read because it shows what people who had a real kind of sense of what was going on in a very deep and scholarly way, what they were mm -hmm. seeing about the United States and its problems uh, early mm -hmm. on. So 
there's a lot we could just do reading we could do a reading list for the rest of the time but we probably yes. don't want to do that maybe we'll collaborate <laughs> on a reading list you know i love reading lists <laughs> of course i could see so you nodding that would be wonderful I could see you nodding. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and someone from the audience is asking um if you could tell us about who inspires you they're asking is it aoc uh, is it maryam kaba you know who inspires you all of them <laughs> uh, are both are today both of them right um i think that uh we are seeing such a remarkable um blossoming of black the black freedom struggle that i have been involved with for so many decades and black black lives matter and the movement for black lives uh, just imagine if that movement did not exist and George Floyd had been lynched. Think about it. What would we be doing and where would we be if that movement did not exist and had not been built? But it was, and it really came to the fore with demonstrations, protests that went on for days into months this summer in every single state in the United States. People say, the New York Times said, that it's the largest political movement that we have seen in the United States until now. And that makes it different from the civil rights movement because right. the civil rights movement was not a widespread popular movement. It had incredible impact upon the political economy and the society at the time, as we well know. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, symbolized in some ways by the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and many other, uh, many other uh, important historical uh, breakthroughs. Right. But it was not like a movement that people in suburbs and little towns were gonna come out for in the, in the far west. <laughs> When you think about what happened in this country this past uh, summer with people in places where they don't even have any black people or any other kind of people of color and they're out there with signs saying black lives matter this is a breakthrough mm -hmm. there's a consciousness that was built through the slaughter of this poor individual mm -hmm. it is just so like when when we think about in our private moments about what they do to us as black people it's a it's a miracle that we get up every day and put one foot in front of the other and decide okay i'm going to keep on trying because to say that it is heart rending heart destroying is there are no words to talk about how awful it is to live in a place that treats black bodies the way that our bodies are treated. And I say this as someone who remembers when Emmett Till was lynched. Right. I remember that. I was only, what, eight years old at the time. I didn't really know what had happened, but I do remember the people in my family talking with incredible, incredible uh, distress about Emmett Till. It's a name that I knew from 1955 to today. And of course, only in later years did I know what had happened to him. Uh, I'm sure if my sister and I and I ask, like, who's Emmett Till and what happened? I'm sure they would have explained it to us in a way that would not have terrified us as babies. But as I said, that's a long time to be dealing with this level of uh, terrorism and uh, hatred. But um, you you asked about people I admire, and yes, I absolutely admire. Um, AOC, the entire squad. I'm so excited about Cori Bush. I don't know what to do. <laughs> yes. I've not met her, but I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm down with anything that she is going to be doing uh, for her uh, district and mm -hmm. for our nation. And also Maria Makaba, I have not met her, but you know, like we can, we communicate sometimes mm -hmm. through social media, but there are so many people who are just so uh, amazing. Charlene, Charlene Carruthers, mm -hmm. who was the uh, executive director of the uh, BYP 100 Black Youth Project 
100. She's actually a personal friend, and I'm very happy to be able uh, to say that. Uh, Tourmaline, uh, who uh, uh, used the name previously, Rena Gossett, a mm. genius. I mean, there's, there's so many wonderful people. Um, I, I feel like really lucky and really blessed to have stayed on earth this long so that I get to interact with people who are a couple of, at least a couple of generations away and younger from uh, my, my early years. They're keeping the spirit going. Yeah. And how do you maintain um, optimism, especially at a moment where there's, you know, as you pointed out, so much violence, um, that we're dealing with as, you know, as black people in this country and, and not only in this country, but just on a global scale, how do you manage to maintain optimism? Well, I say this um, frequently. I have always been a political optimist, not a personal optimist, but a political one. And that's because I've been fortunate to be able to be involved in struggle. That makes me an optimist because I have seen the impact and the success of political struggle in real time and even uh, having impact on my own life so that it's not just something I read about or read about in a book. It's like, yeah, you know, when I was born, um, you know, there were, you know, there was segregation everywhere. <laughs> and, you know, George Wallace popped up and said, you know, segregation today, <laughs> segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. That was my life, you know? And now we don't have official segregation. We still have segregation, but we don't have it like on the books. Um, and who knows with this new Supreme Court, we may have it on the books again, because, you know, there are people now on the court who, even though they might say that they think Brown v. Board of Education is settled law, a lot of these judges that uh, 45 has appointed who are unqualified you know, in every way, quite a few of them don't think that v Brown v. Board of Education is settled law. But be that as it may, as I said, I've seen the trajectory of change. Um, being a socialist uh, helps to make me an optimist because I understand uh, the dialectic and I understand that um, things you know, reformulate and change, situations reformulate and change so you get to another level of struggle. That's what's constantly mm -hmm. happening. And just as I talked about from the abolition of slavery to the demolishing of segregation to defunding the police, that's a trajectory because some of those other, those other two things were at least partially addressed. So as I said, um, I just feel that that's, um, you know, that's where I get the energy from. Mm -hmm. And someone from the audience is asking, uh, since ending white supremacy requires work on so many fronts uh, that don't always collaborate, for example, gun violence, climate change, reproductive justice, and so on, uh, where can individuals put their time and money to help? I missed the first part of the question. Could you say the first part again? Sure. And so the question was about, you know, since ending white supremacy requires work on so many different fronts uh, that don't always collaborate. So whether we're talking about addressing gun violence or climate change, reproductive justice, uh, where the question is where can individuals or perhaps we can adjust it to say where should uh, individuals uh, put their time and money to help? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, as far as your time, you need to do work that uh, fills your soul and that you feel drawn to. If you're not interested in a particular aspect of, this, of systemic oppression, then find another place to do that work. I always tell people this, you should not be miserable in the context of doing your political work. If you don't feel, feel whole, if you don't feel seen, if you don't feel loved even, then move on to another organization or another front of the struggle. That's always possible to do. <clears throat> I'm sorry to be hoarse. Um, let me take a sip of water. It's okay. Yeah, we're covering just an array <laughs> of amazing and important topics. So take your time. Right. Thank you. Um, and um, 
I think that um, it's it, as I said, you really need to find a, pl a place to do your work that fulfills you. There's a wonderful article in a book called Home Girls, a Black Feminist Anthology, and it's the last article in the book by Bernice Johnson Reagan. And the title of that article is Coalition Politics Turning the Century. It was uh, transcribed from a speech that she gave, I think no later than 1980, probably uh, might've been 79. It was at a women's music festival in, in Yosemite uh, National Park in California. In California. And she, but, but note the title, Coalition Politics Turning the Century. 20 years before the century did turn, she was looking forward to that. And she was in SNCC. She was in the Albany, Georgia Freedom Movement. She was a SNCC freedom singer, and she was the founder of Sweet Honey in the Rock. That is Bernice Johnson Reagan, also mother of Toshi Reagan. So her, her uh, resume is just like, uh, you can't, nobody can even match that. But in her article, which I ch uh, put at the end of the book, because I wanted people, if you didn't get anything out, else out of reading Home Girls, I wanted people to leave with this perspective and this grounding of we got to work in coalition and we have to do it with um, the kind of consciousness that we can do it for the long haul. That's one of the things that she writes about or talks, you know, as I said, tra transcribed from a speech, but that's one of the things in the article uh, that, you know, people, you know, who do it for the long haul and have done it for the long haul that can be, you know, that can be a challenge. Now, as far as where to give your money, um, I think it's important to give money to organizations that are doing direct action mm -hmm. to the degree that that's possible. Um, and there are a whole array of them. I'm actually going to be doing an event on uh, Tuesday, the 17th for Resist, uh, which is a grassroots foundation based in Boston, the Boston area that started back during the Vietnam War. And I'm so looking forward uh, to doing uh, that. I'm doing that with uh, Joshua Allen. So you can probably find that on my Twitter feed if, or either on the Resist, you know, you know just look up mm -hmm. Resist and you'll find information about that. Resist is a great place to send uh, support to because of the fact that it supports hundreds of grassroots small organizations with small grants. It is, by, it is not the Ford Foundation. In fact, it's the opposite of the Ford Foundation. Um, and as I said, I, I always like groups that are doing direct action. Um, the Southern Poverty Law Center is a very uh, dear, I'm just talking about who I give to and right. work that I admire. And I've been a supporter of the Southern Poverty Law Center since they opened. And I think that was 1972. And I've never had much pocket change, never. Mm -hmm. So my donations, you know, during all those years, I am now up to $11 a month. That's what I can do. But I've been doing it since 1972. Um, and then I like, uh, there's a Rosenberg Fund for Children that um, gives support to children who, whose parents have been targeted because of their political activity. And of course it was, it was started by one of the Rosenberg sons their parents uh, were killed by, executed by the state during the McCarthy era because they were accused of, uh, of trading communist uh, secrets with communist uh, Russia. So, or the Soviet Union, I should say at that time. Mm -hmm. So that's dear to me. Children's charities are very important to me and I do support children's charities, but yeah, direct action's good. You'll find, you'll, they'll be calling you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I, I want to shift gears a little bit and, and talk about uh, LGBTQ rights. And in fact, I, as we were talking earlier about some of the critiques of high profile Democrats about uh, the loss of congressional seats, what's interesting, uh, I think, uh, is that while some people are criticizing and pointing out all of these challenges, this is also the year where we witness um, as far as I know, the first two openly gay uh, black members of Congress. Uh, and so as someone who has been involved uh, in the fight for LGBTQ rights uh, since the 1970s, 
what does this moment mean to you? Uh, and, and, and clearly knowing that the fight is not over and recognizing also the limitations of symbols as we've already discussed, uh, right. where would you direct activists to continue their work? Um, I'm really happy that uh, those two uh, brothers, uh, and I'm making the assumption that they used, <laughs> I may be wrong, because I'll just say mm -hmm. they. I'm glad that they um, were successful in their campaigns. And um, we will look to see what they will contribute to our uh, national political um, ac actions at a very a time of great division. Uh, there's an important role for good people in elected office to play during this time. Um, but representation, as you pointed out, has its limitations. It's about what you do uh, with, you know, with your position as opposed to who you are. And uh, I'm thinking about uh, the wonderful person uh, who is in, I'm gonna take out my phone and see if I can get this information, but I'm thinking about the wonderful person in uh, Minneapolis who is on the uh, city council, mm -hmm. who is a, uh, I guess, one of the first black trans uh, women to be. Uh, oh, yes. And I know her name begins with an A. <laughs> and of course, Didn't find it yet, but Didn't anyway, it. is it Andrea? Yes, I think it's Andrea Jenkins. Yes, yes. that's who it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I'm not, I don't know why I'm not seeing it in my address book, but <laughs> it should be there. But anyway, um, that's an example of somebody with a particular identity, um, an identi uh, our, our identities plural that are multiply oppressed. If that was all. That, that would be important because that's a, uh, that's a breakthrough mm -hmm. for people, our various uh, communities, our LGBTQIA plus communities. Mm -hmm. But she's a person who called for abolishing the police in Minneapolis. Right. So it's not just about who you are. Mm -hmm. it's, about, um, it's about what you do. And I was introduced uh, to her. That's why I was looking at my phone. <laughs> I was introduced to her this summer. We've exchanged some messages uh, of support just for continuing to do uh, the work. But that's what I'm looking for. It's okay. not just about identity. There's a lot of confusion about identity politics. Um, and identity politics has just been decimated by ignorance mm -hmm. and by distortion. What we meant when we use the term back in uh, 1977 in our Combahee River Collective Statement was that it's very simple. Black women have a right to set our own political agendas, period. Black women have a right based upon our multiple identities, but specifically as black women to set our own political agendas. Nobody agreed that that was the case at the time. You know, we could not get an amen on that. But we said it anyway. And what we were saying is that uh, black politics without an analysis of gender doesn't work gender and uh, sexuality mm -hmm. and uh, feminist politics without an analysis of race doesn't work either. We need to be able to build politics based upon the experiences that we have based upon the oppressions that affect us. And as I said, people have done all kinds of things with identity politics, including their attacks from the left uh, about identity politics now. That's unfortunate. I have not been involved in the LGBTQIA plus movement for many mm -hmm. years because it went into a direction, it was going in a direction when I stopped being active, that was too narrow for me. And I've written about that. I had an article in the New York Times last uh, year about why I left uh, the mainstream movement. Having said that, the oppression still exists. The oppressions, plural, still exist. Marriage did not solve 
most of it because if you're if you don't, if you don't have any place to 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 live and you don't have a job and you don't have health care and you are being murdered in disproportionate numbers i'm thinking particularly of trans women of color then marriage what's what, what did marriage do so we need to keep on struggling we need to have a multi-issued agenda yeah Thank you for that. And, you know, time is winding down. And so I'm just going to ask one final question. Uh, and you're welcome to also offer any closing remarks too that you'd like. Uh, but what advice do you have for activists of color, uh, especially queer activists, you know, as the nation enters into this new administration, how should those of us who are uh, committed to social justice handle, or I, or I should say cope with, the sheer number of people who voted for Trump's uh, bigoted and narrow view of America's future. Uh, what is the path forward? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, my first bit of advice is don't believe the hype. Do not um, fall into traps of like, oh, uh, we have uh, this kind of representative or that kind of representative. Everything's going to be all right from now on. I think it's Rachel Maddow who says, and this is a really good thing to say, don't listen to what they say, watch what they do mm -hmm. and have a really rigorous analytical response to an approach to watching what they do. It's so important. Um, I, I don't know if I mentioned, you know, at this time, uh, 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 during this time of uh, this wonderful conversation, I don't know if I mentioned having an anti-capitalist perspective, that capitalism drives, you know, many of the isms that we're talking about, right. and it um, limits what our possibilities are. It limits the possibilities of a full-fledged, decent human life, because capitalism is about one thing, which is profit for the few. We have income inequality, we have imperialism and militarism, that we export uh, to other countries, all kinds of things done in that uh, name of keeping capitalism shored up. So can you keep an eye out for those economic, um, those econo economic repercussions, keep an eye out for white supremacy, uh, keep an eye out for liberalism, because liberalism never got us anywhere, I'm here to tell you. <laughs> we used to call them back in the 60s, wishy-washy liberals. <laughs> and that's still the case. Martin Luther King wrote about the moderates, the white moderates, you know, well, white moderates, wishy-washy liberals, they're all, they're all the same and they don't mean us any good. So uh, we uh, really have to uh, keep our eyes open. And, and also we need to uh, continue to be immersed in struggle. Uh, that's why uh, I have the energy that I do um, at this stage of life because I'm involved in struggle and I'm, I'm so happy. I don't have any regrets about the commitments that I have made, whatever the sacrifices were, because it's really about pushing this human uh, project forward and for everyone to have all the things that they need, the rights that they need, the material uh, necessities that they need, the opportunities that they need. I'm serious about that. And as I said, that's what gets me up in the morning. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You know, earlier someone asked the question about who inspired you. And as you were talking, I was just reflecting on how much you've inspired me. And so it's just been a true honor to have this conversation. I hope there, there, I hope there'll be an opportunity for us to, to meet um, in person, fingers crossed in the near future. But I just wanna iterate my thanks to you for this conversation and thank you to everyone who took the time to join us this afternoon. And can I say one more thing yes, about ahead. our interaction? So Keisha and uh, Keisha, Professor Blaine. It's okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Professor Blaine and uh, Ibram Kendi have a wonderful book that's coming out um, in February. Yes. Um, and it's called 400 Souls, right? And uh, I, am, I am very honored to have a piece in it about the Combahee River Collective. So 
we uh, every so often professor blaine and i cook some things up you know so we've been cooking some things up uh, yes. in the last couple of years and that's one of them so i hope you'll find that book and enjoy it yes and as, we, as we've been talking today i now have some new ideas so i'll be reaching out for how we can collaborate some more great thank you thanks, thanks everybody again.